the way I like it. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn titled Creative Problem Solving. Uh, we do have a slight change in speaker due to illness, so we're excited to welcome Monty Land today to talk about this topic. Um, just a quick reminder that these are recorded, so if you can't stay for the whole session, we do record them and then we can send them out afterwards in a follow-up email. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use, utilize the Q&A and chat feature. We'll get to as many as we can at the end, or if Monty feels that he wants to answer them throughout the session, he will do that as well. Um, so with that, we welcome Monty to talk about creative problem solving. All right. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Creative Problem Solving. You already know my name, and I'm a facilitator that will be joining you this afternoon, and hopefully by the time we're done, I'll share something with you that will give you some new insights and some new ideas on how to use a problem solving the creative way and do it as a tool that helps you. Uh, I'm a, a large advocate of taking care of yourself. I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge, that's like, if my, my thought process is this. If you don't take care of yourself, the question is who will? And that's very important. So one of the largest takeaways I want you to have from today is knowing that it's okay to be selfish. As a matter of fact, I want you to write that down for me and make that your note. If you don't remember anything else I say today, I want you to take a note of this, that it's okay to be selfish. All right. And this is why I say that, because when it comes to solving problems, being creative and how you do it, the approach that you have and the personnel that you deal with, when it comes to problem, solving problems, one factor that always goes into it is you, okay? And what do you, what I mean by that is simply this, when there's a problem and you're involved, many times we get overwhelmed or we get super consumed with what's going on and how it, and, and, and you know, what the bottom line is and we lose focus. But one thing that we tend to lose focus on most when it comes to solving problems is ourselves. And it's not so much the problem, but what happens to you throughout the problem solving concept or throughout the problem solving process. I mean, because when you face certain things, when you deal with certain issues, what happens? Your stress levels go up, your blood pressure rises. Sometimes we get a little angry or a little frustrated, you know, the tension begins to grow. And when all of those things happen, it impacts your body. It impacts you internally. It impacts the way you think. It changes the process that you do work. And the results that you have are completely different than the way or the outcome that we want to have. And so in order to get those things to move in the, the direction we need to go, the first thing you have to do is remember to take care of yourself. Here's why. Sometimes we get overwhelmed or super consumed with problems and trying to solve problems and trying to solve other people's problems that we lose ourselves and that's where we do the most damage. And the majority of that damage comes through stress. Okay, so when we go through this process today, I want you to remember that this is very important when I say it's okay to be selfish, that you keep your stress levels low, and you don't allow problems or issues to consume your life. Because when you allow those things, things to consume your life, it takes you to an early grave. I was like, dude, why are you talking about this? We're talking about creative problem solving. Here's why many people, <laughs> they try to solve problems or solve too many, or they don't, they don't talk about it or go about it the right way. And internally, it affects you. And, and this is a truth and, and you're in the health. Okay, so you all, I'm sure, probably already understand it or know this. But 80% of hospital-related illnesses, roughly 80% is a stat that I that I came to about an average of. 80% of hospital-related illnesses are related to stress, right? What do you think the majority of those issues of stress come from? problems, issues, concerns, being overwhelmed or, or superly consumed, over, overly consumed with what's happening in our lives. But if I find a creative way to solve my problems or solve the problems that are around me, the stress goes away. So the aches and the pains that I have in my body and the illnesses that we have that oftentimes end up to sickness and you know uh, internal organ issues and all the other stuff that goes with it from the poison that we do and in, in, infuse on ourselves, it'll go away. So keep that in mind as we go through this process. So I want to welcome you now to the largest room in the world. And I'm sure some of you already know what it is. But to me, the largest room in the world is the room for improvement. So I want you to walk away today feeling like, man, this was worth my time with the 30, 45 minutes, the entire hour, if you can stay around the, the entire time that it was worth my time being here today, because I feel so much better. Or I have something new that I've learned, or, you know, even if you don't hear it from me, a thought that may come to your mind to help you process what's going on, 
to allow you to see things so much differently. All right, so let's get into it. I know that was a long introduction, but I have to throw this and I want to put this disclaimer out first. And that that is simply that everything that I say today, my thoughts and my views, my opinions are solely based on me, the presenter. OK, these are my ideas there. And it's just an, it's, it's an, a way for me to give you general tips and tools or give you something to add to your toolbox that will allow you to see things from a different perspective or maybe remind you of something you already do. And, and move forward. This is not a one size fit all. I can't solve everybody's problems. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a, you know, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but my job as a presenter is to share those things with you. And now when I'm finished with this, I'll give you the information to reach out to the EAP who's, who we're presenting this for and how we came to uh, be with you all this afternoon. And that's the employee assistance program where we have so many tools and tips and so many ways that you can begin to build yourself up and, and renew how you feel and, and see things from a different perspective. Or if you need to talk to someone one-on-one uh, -on -one that can get you to leading or living a better lifestyle, that's what you want to do. So the disclaimer at the bottom line is I don't want to be held liable and I can't be held liable because you know what, this is what Monty said and this should have changed my life or this should have been the end all. And that's not the reality. So I just want to put that out there. All right. And so like we were instructed at the very beginning, or you were told at the beginning, we're not using GoToWebinar, but if you could use the chat feature and drop your questions in there, it'll save time at the end to have a Q&A. And hopefully we'll get a chance to answer them all if you have any questions. And uh, we'll get to that when we get there. All right. So let's move into it. So today we have six objectives that we're working through. And this is what the training is designed to do is number one, let's define a problem. Because I'm a firm believer if we don't have a definition or we don't define what it is that we're working towards or what we're looking for as a solution, we don't know what it is, it's difficult to do, okay? So we're going to start off with the definition or what I call the working definition. Then after that, we're going to differentiate what the look at the differenti differentiation of problems from conflict because they are different. And when you look at problems and you look at conflict, you know, and I'll probably repeat this later, but I, I give thought to while it comes fresh in my mind. But know this, that conflict is inevitable and it's going to happen. It's, it's a reality of life because I know the majority of you, like probably 99 percent of you live in a perfect world. You're perfect people. You have no issues. And, you know, you wake up in the morning and you sing and, you know, you see rainbows and unicorns floating around. But then it's once you leave your bedroom or you leave your house and it's the other people on the outside that create the problem, right? But we, and we have conflicts, but it's gonna happen. But know this, that even though conflict is inevitable, there's a way to find a solution and go around it. The next thing is we're gonna, you know, be able to manage complex problems, look at it on a larger scale or a small scale. How do we find a solution? Then after that, we're gonna understand your role in it. Because many times when we look at your role, when you look at how you approach things or the role that you take moving into the process or through the problem solving process, especially being creative, in the way that you do it, know that sometimes, and you can write this down, it's not my problem to solve. I mean, what do you mean? It's, but, but I'm involved. Sometimes it's not your problem to solve. And we'll get into that because sometimes we deal with difficult people and we know that, and you, you can look around and I know it's nobody here, but outside that you work with, but outside of work, you know, there are people that just seem to always yeah, find a problem with everything. <laughs> and then you have to realize because they have internal issues or things that they deal with, it's not for you to solve that problem, but understand your role as you go through the process. And we're going to discover some alternative solutions. When you look at the alternate solutions as to what I can do versus the way that I'm currently doing it, I want you to be able to say, okay, this is what I've tried before, but that hasn't worked or it doesn't work with this particular person because there is no one size fit all. And because we have different ways or different methods of approaching things, this is how, you know, I know to do it. But let's look at some alternate solutions. Because one thing that I, I and I, I'll put this out there, is that people oftentimes, we, we have a way of, the way of doing things. We have certain methodologies that we use on a daily basis. And the ones that we use aren't always the best for everyone. And so what we have to learn to do is, because we, we use this rule, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. Well, here's the reality. <laughs> I can treat you the way that I want to be treated, but that's not always your reality. The reality of it is that sometimes we have to learn to treat people the way they want to be treated. And there, there is a difference because the way that I think someone should respond to me or the way they should say, say things to me or the body language they use, the tone of voice they use, it, it applies to me a little bit differently than it would to somebody else. But when I learn the person and, I, and they can see that I genuinely care about who they are, that's where the change comes in because I'm now treating them the way they want to be treated. Matter of fact, write this down for me. 
because it comes from a caring perspective. When it comes to problem solving and caring for you and the other person, write this down. And that is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And you've probably heard that before, but when it comes to problem solving, that's a fact. If you really care about someone, the conflict doesn't go or the, the problems don't continue to rise and, and continue to be the same way. And we don't go about it the same way when we care about people. You know, you ever have a disagreement with someone, and this is kind of like off script right now, but I haven't, I, I know exactly where I'm going, but you ever have a disagreement with someone and when you walk away, your thought process is, I don't care how you feel. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. That's the attitude we take. We don't often say it out loud, but that's the, pro the thought process that we have. But when we take that thought process, we, we dismiss the feelings and the emotions from the other person. The empathy that is in our lives or the empathy that we should share with other people, although they may have been wrong or done us wrong, that's how we feel. And when we develop the I don't care mentality, like, hmm, it doesn't matter to me how you feel or what you care about, that begins to spill over into what we do in other areas of life. And so when we do it that way and we take that approach, what we begin to miss is caring for people outside of us or the empathetic part of us that we should show to other people. So we'll talk about that. And then of course, the last thing is to, is to do the checkup. All right, so when we look at problem solving, you look, you know, you have the problem, the analysis and the solution. And the biggest thing that I want you to take away from today is, although we're looking at different ways, is creating a solution. The thought that you should have when you finish is this. My whole purpose of sitting through this webinar or you know, trying to find new ways to do it is to be a, a solutionist or create solutions. All right. Right here, here's a way that I can I can give it to you. Write this down. I know I'm asking you to write a lot, but I want you to have a takeaway, at least one of these things that hopefully you'll be able to use. But this is what I need you to remember is don't be a problem cider, be a problem solver. Don't be a problem cider, be a problem solver. People who create solutions get paid and get paid well, not always financially, but you pay yourself well by having lower blood pressure and having less stress in your life. You pay the people around you because you create a, an environment or you, you create a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not, and, well, you create, a, create an environment but, uh, uh, oh man, what's the word I'm looking for? A culture, there you go. You create a culture that people like because you find solutions to what it is. You ever notice that certain people show up to you if something happens, no matter how bad it is, the entire world will be on fire and they come to you directly to get instructions. Why? Because they know you're a solutionist or you find solutions to big problems. And that's why they come to you. So when we look at problem solving skills, one of the largest things or the first things we need to do is active listening. It's, an, it's one of the hardest things for us to do, and that is listen to people all the way through, actively listening, paying attention to what they're saying, or paying attention to hear the need behind the need. What is this person really saying to me? Because sometimes the problem that we see at the surface, it's not what's going on on the inside. And sometimes the issues that are happening on the inside of them or with that particular person changes how they feel or, or the approach that they would normally take. And then sometimes we'll say that person's out of character or that's not who they are, or I know them to be better than that. But when we actively listen, we can hear what's going on beneath. And that's why, okay, I can, uh, let me see, let me see. all right, yeah, I can use this, I can use this. Watch this, when I actively listen, although the person is telling me, you know what, I'm frustrated with how long it takes to get a response from, you know, the other department that we're that we're working with. They understand, they know what we're doing or they know what the deadline is or what the goals are that we have, but it just really frustrates, fr frustrates me. And they go on and on about how frustrated they are and they're having a rough day, but here's what's really happening. You see at face value how they feel and what they're telling you, but if you listen long enough and you ask the right questions, this is what you'll find out. It's not the problem with the other department, it is this man, I'm really short financially or I had a rough time with some bills this month or my electric bill was a little bit more, the cost of inflation, making food costs or, or go, go higher and how am I going to afford my groceries? You know what? If I'm late one more time, there's a possibility that somebody could, my car could be repossessed. You know, man, my mom or my dad or my, my child is really sick. 
How am I going to afford? The, is the healthcare going to cover it? Or I hope they feel begin to feel better. Or I hope the things that are happening to them don't happen to me. Or, it's really tough what's going on in the world today. And, and what if that happens in my community or in my neighborhood? What am I going to do? That's the part we don't see. So when we actively listen and we peel the onion back, we hear the need behind the need. What is this person really saying to me? So it's not that they're out of character. It is at that moment, they're out of touch with the reality kind of of what they're facing and they don't know how to deal with it. So sometimes it creates an issue. So if we listen actively, hear what they're saying, respond, nod. Okay. And one thing that I do, and you can try to, is when I talk to people, I'll tell them, listen, I'm taking notes. So if you see me writing, I'm not doing anything else. I'm paying attention because it may be something that they said that's very important to them that I find important to me. And I can write it down so I can go back and refresh that question. Or I'll tell them, listen, I don't have anything to write on, but I'm going to text what you're saying to myself so I can come back to the notes. So when you finish talking, I can address your point. And they don't think that I'm texting somebody else or talking to somebody else. So that way I can address it at that moment. See, those are the things that allow us to actively listen. And instead of responding right away, what do we do? We hear what they're saying. And then it allows me time to think through the process and ask them other questions that does what? Peel that onion back. So instead of looking at why they're frustrated on the outside, I can really hear what's happening on the inside of them because they'll always tell me. And that's very important. So that's a problem solving skill that you can use. All right. Then, of course, do analysis and research. Pay attention to what's going on in their lives and, 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 and pay attention to what, what how people think. The research is, OK, let me watch your patterns after you've worked around a person for so long. And I don't know if you're in a hybrid situation or if you're you know, in the office space, but you learn people after a while. You know who walks through the office, you know who walks fast, you know who walks slow, you know who drags their feet, you know the guy that wears, wears cowboy boots, you know who wears sneakers, you know the lady that wears heels. Why? Because you can hear certain things and before they even get to your door, you know who's coming because we've developed that sense. The research is this is who they normally are. This is who the, their attitude is. This is how they smile, they laugh and what they are. But when I don't see that, you know, it not so much that it draws a large concern, but it allows me to think, okay, is this where I intervene or this is where I begin to understand? And then it takes create creativity and innovation because the same way that you probably have raised your children, it's not the same way we're in, in, in solve conflicts in your home or if you're a sibling, you had siblings and the way your parents did it, it's not the same way that we can do it in the work environment. Like for me, you know, I, I, I my children are all adults now. The youngest is 21 and, you know, the youngest two are in college now. And um, the way that I responded to issues or, or the way that I solved you know, conflict between them, you know, the sibling conflicts when they were younger is different now because I don't do it from a parental role. I do it from someone who's talking to adults and now I'm your friend. Yeah, if they need me to advice, I'll go through that process with them. But my approach is different. And then also it allows me to hear things from a younger, younger adult uh, perspective from now moving into the professional realm, arena. So you have to do the same thing. The level of creativity or the level of innovation that you use moving forward changes the, how people see you and it allows you to change. Remember, I told you, now you're in the largest room in the world. Okay, what can I do that's new? Or what am I hearing that's different that I can take a different approach to? I, okay, I'll say it like this. If you respond to problems the same way today that you did five years ago, something's wrong. Well, it worked then. Well, everything that worked then doesn't work now. Can you imagine if you show up and work, show up to work tomorrow, and instead of this being recorded, you being able to go back and watch it on on a Zoom call, someone sent you a cassette tape so you'd have to listen to it, <laughs> or sent you a VHS tape. You have no computer, no laptop. They give you a typewriter and some and, and some typing paper, and you'd be like, "What is this? Why? Because it's outdated. That method doesn't work anymore." So instead of sending emails and someone gets it and less than two or three seconds. If it's a large email, they get it in a minute. You have to lick an envelope and put letters together, put stamps on it, take it to a mailbox or to give it to your letter carrier and move it. Does that method work? Absolutely not. It's outdated. See, sometimes we have to be willing to change and look at ourselves and say, you know what? I need to take a different approach as I do this. And when, as I take a different approach, it innovates me. It causes me to grow. Don't get stuck where you are. Here's what happens many times when it comes to solving problems, because we've done certain things so long in a certain way, it forces us to die. Yeah. And I don't mean physically like, you know, you, you've left earth and you land in a casket and somebody buries you on the ground. What I mean by you, it forces us to die. People die as this, they die here. When you die here, it changes the dynamic of who you are. I'm going to be this way for the rest of my life because this is, a, this is the way I've done it. This is the way it will always be. 
And instead of forward thinking or moving, going on to find another way to do it, we die. And then from that point, we wait to be buried. You understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So be creative in everything that you do. Never stop. Always be willing to learn. Read a book or listen to a podcast. Listen to something that will help you. Reach out to the EAP. You know, oh, you know what? Yeah, I've tried this method before and it's not working. So what, we, what, what I suggest that you do is this. Create your own ways. of Start something new. Ask the people around you because we have a generational gap on how we do things and how creativity happens and what we innovate. And even though, as you see here, how we communicate with people, because communication is a large part of it. How do I communicate? But well, now we have five generations in the workplace from the, the tradi traditionalists and the boomers down to what is it now? Gen Z, I think it is, or Gen X, who Gen somebody, you know, past the millennial age. I, I, I yeah, kind of lost count, but uh, I think I'm Gen X. But anyway, whoever it is now, Gen Z, how do we bridge that communication gap? How do we do it? So you have to allow your words to be the bridge builder and who you become and changing lives and solving problems. Use empathy in everything you do. You, when I say use empathy, you know how to talk to people, but be genuine when you do it. You ever have someone talk to you or speak to you, or you can be you can be having the greatest day of your life and you walk through the grocery store, you pass someone on the street or in a coffee shop or whatever, and you speak to them, you say, good morning. And they say, good morning. And they give you that. And then it, it, it just goes away. Yeah. Sometimes you have to have empathy for that person because you really don't know what they're thinking or how they feel. Because many times when you see this, this I'm not the scientist, but studies have shown when people speak to you and they give you this, and they, as they walk away or in passing, it means they're disgusted or don't want to be bothered. No, so now I have to create a, a level of empathy for them because they don't feel the way that I do and I don't know what all of the issues are. So have a standard or a set of core values that you use that as you go through this process of solving problems, and you're not going to solve everybody's problem, but use empathy. Set your core values. Like for me, I, 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 may, I have a list of core values that I go by every single day. But okay, so I have two sets. One set I've never gotten rid of. I spent 22 and a half years on active duty as a Marine. And the core values of the Marine Corps was honor, courage, and commitment. Those are three things I'll never let go of. It's been inbred in me. It's been ingrained in me since I was probably 18, 19 years old. Now I'm 50, but those things will never go away. And then I use my own name, Monty, as an acronym, as my core values of things that I stick to. And it's motivated, open-hearted, nurturing, tenacious, and empathetic. I use those core values on how I deal with people every single day. And what it does, it allows me to be flexible. It allows me, it makes me resilient. And it shows the impartiality of not just who I am, but seeing other people. See, at some point, you have to make a, a, a firm decision to change who you are and the way that you approach problems, the way you approach issues. Be creative. Never stop thinking. Never stop dreaming. Never stop, you know, being who you are, because what that's going to do is allow you to move to a place where every day I'm growing. And so when people are having issues, your creative ways of thinking will help them get through the problem. And then you'll see yourself. You know what, man, I, I, I will not be in that position again. I'm going to share a quick story, which I'm going to give you the short version of it. OK, and then we're going to get right through it. Here's where the change came from me. I had a disagreement with someone at work one time, and I'm giving you this happened over a span of a week. OK, so it started on Monday. We were deploying in two weeks. So we try to take as much time off as we can, spend time with your family, your friends, your loved ones, that sort of thing before you go. And so. We were going to take a long and extended weekend. So we would get off on Friday. We wouldn't have to come back to Tuesday. So I told him on Monday, say, look, this is what I need done. I need all of this stuff done by Thursday afternoon. Long story short, we go through the process. One of the people that were, that were working for me, she she didn't get her part done. So I'm asking her questions. I'm like, hey, it's Wednesday. Everything's got to be done tomorrow. Oh, I got it. I got it. I have it. I have it. Fast forward the story. Thursday, nothing happened. And so we had a disagreement. And then that disagreement got kind of, it, it got loud. And then it turned into a one-way conversation. I was doing all the talking. And she was just listening. And then so I, I divided up her work between some other sergeants that I had. They took care of it. And then Friday, uh, it, it escalated again. And so she was, you know, from the point of you didn't have to give my assignment to somebody else, whatever, whatever. So at this point now I'm fuming. So instead of me leaving at noon on Friday, I didn't leave till four because we had to wait for the other stuff to get done. And it was her and I and a couple of other people still around. So now it started Thursday. I'm angry Thursday and Friday. Saturday, I wake up. I'm still a little frustrated about it. Uh, go do some yard work, do whatever. And then about two o'clock Saturday night, well, Sunday morning, I wake up out of my sleep and I'm feeling my heart like this. 
like it was about to jump out of my chest. I'm like, oh my God, man, am I having a heart attack? What's going to happen? So I didn't tell my wife where I was going. I slide out of the bed. I drive myself to the ER. I was like, well, I'll go and let them check me out and I'll be back. Well, seven o'clock rolls around <laughs> Sunday morning and my wife was like, calls me, hey, where are you at? Oh, uh, in the hospital. Why didn't you tell me? You know, so that was a whole ordeal. So they give me a stress test. They, you know, take EKGs, all these tests, no heart attack, no stroke, none of that. Mm-hmm. And so to just to get through the story, uh, the doctor, it's like 10 o'clock Sunday morning now. The doctor comes in and, you know, he's, you know, we're going to let you go. No medications, none of that. Mm-hmm. And he gets to the doorway and he stops. And he turns around and looks at me and he said, did you have an argument with someone before you came in here? I said, I didn't have one before I came in. But I told him, went through the story. I told him what happened on Thursday and Friday and how it was still frustrating. Me. Oh, I allow it to frustrate me. He said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, the argument you had over those two days could have killed you. And, and you had a heart attack and you've been gone mad about something that really doesn't even matter. I was like, wow, that day it changed my life. And this is how it changed my life. From that day forward, I never allow myself to get angry when problems arise or issues arrive. I think of a creative way of what can I do to number one, save myself and keep me from going to the hospital and laying in the bed and having stress tests and EKGs and, you know, heart monitors, all this kind of stuff, having heart palpitations and upset. And then what can I do to save the other person to show my level, to show a level of empathy to them that can change their lives. I tell you that story for this reason. As you go through this, this process, number one, you have to define the problem. When you're defining the problems and what's going on, think of yourself first. This is why I tell you that that selfish portion comes in, because you ask yourself, if this happened to me, is it worth me going to the hospital? And then the next question I want you to ask yourself, is it worth, is it going to matter in the next three to five years? And the most important question is, <laughs> is it worth me dying? Absolutely not. So let's find some ways that we can do it. So let's define a problem. Number one, we're going to write down a problem and be specific. Write it down. Here's why. It's going to allow you to focus on what's really happening. And then after you write it down, you ask, where is the problem? Is it me or is it the other person? And then how is it a problem and how does it impact us? Is it the way that we communicate? Is it our body language? Is it the methods that we use that slow us down from moving forward or wherever it is we want to go in life? Is it holding us back? What part does it play on the team, on the department? on us as a whole, as a company, and then does it affect the bottom line? Once we know how it is a problem, hey, will it still be there tomorrow? And these are the things I tell you to ask yourself, will this really matter, this conflict matter in the next 30 days? Will it matter in three to five years? Because you'll look back at it and say, you know what, I got upset about that. That was really stupid. I think about how mad I got. That was over, I think, probably like, man, ooh, almost 15, 16 years ago. It's longer than that. Yeah, about, it was 2006, 2006. Since that day, I've never allowed myself to get that angry. I refuse. I'm too, I'm, I tell myself this, I'm worth way too much to be frustrated by a problem. So if it's going to be a problem like today, it doesn't matter to me. So I, that's why I tell you to ask yourself, will it matter in the future? And then look at who's involved. I told you sometimes you have the problem ciders and you have the problem solvers. Many times the problem ciders or the lazy or the procrastinator is the one that creates the problem because they see things one way, one dimensionally, in one direction. So look at who's involved. Then let's look at the entire team, because if it involves all of us, what culture do I want to create? And what do I want the team to see? Who do I want the team to see? Because when you look at yourself, ask yourself this question. Is it worth me ruining my name and my integrity and my character? Here's why. You could have been on a job. I don't care if you've been there 30 days or if you've been there 30 years. You could have done 999 things correct, the right way, use the right methods, the right tone, right body language. But if you mess up one time, what do people remember? The one bad thing I knew, I knew he was, I knew he had issues or I knew she was angry or I knew she was bitter or he was bitter. That's the one thing they remember. So why ruin it for yourself and ruin it for them? Keep your name, keep your integrity and keep your character intact. All right. And then is why is it a reoccurring problem? Many times it's the same person or the same types of people, you know, the snipers that sit back and they shoot, they're hidden and they shoot certain words out and, and, and it impacts the team or they just get silent or sometimes, you know, they, they're the know-it-all. So why is it a problem and why is it reoccurring? So let's, let's, let's ask, ask that question. And then what are the potential outcomes and the solutions? We know the potential outcomes or the solutions that we have will be based on or determined by the things that we choose, the words we choose, the methods that we choose. It's all based on that. So we look at the problem versus the conflict. First of all, I need you to ask yourself, are you conflict averse? Now, I say this to myself. (laughs) I like to say that I am, 
but I know that conflict is going to happen, but we can't avoid it or, or not say anything about it and then realize or think about that it's just going to go away. Listen, know that it's going to happen. Know that conflict is real. At some point, someday, at some time, you're going to see it. It's going to happen. It, it doesn't matter how you can be. As sweet. Listen, I live in North Carolina. I'm from Chicago, but I live in North Carolina. You can be as sweet as the tea is that we drink here in North Carolina. If you ever had North Carolina sweet tea, you know what I'm talking about. But somebody's going to come and squeeze not just a lemon, but lemons in your sweet tea. And it's going to change the taste dramatically because they won't just take a slice. No, they're going to take two or three lemons and squeeze it in your tea and then they'll stir it. And as they're stirring, you're getting angry and you're feeling yourself getting frustrated. But know that it's going to happen. But know that you can't run from it. So even if you are conflict averse, one thing that I will say is this, and I'll share this tool with you at the very end, is the resiliency that you need to continue to move forward. Listen, if you can, if you fall down, if you get knocked down, get back up. What do you do if you hit a flat part, a flat spot or something happens? What do I do? How do I continue to progress? And then do you have a personality conflict? Listen, there's somebody somewhere that we always have a conflict with. And it's not that we mean it. We have different attitudes. You know, like if you put a bunch of alpha men in a room together, if you put 10 alpha men in a room together, everything in the room is not going to go right. It's like you ever watch two rams out in the middle of nowhere and it, boom, that's, that, that's kind of what happens. But then we have the personality. It's not so much the attitude, but the personality conflicts. Listen, you can put them in a room and you can have peace, but somebody's attitude will be a little bit different and then conflict arise. So when it arises, how do we deal with it? Because all of us feel like the, the personality that we have is cool. Everybody should understand who I am, how I operate, the things that are going on in my life and you know, you know my methods. So just kind of roll with it. Well, everybody doesn't roll the way you roll. Sorry. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. That's that's the, that's the reality of life. So understand, you know, ask the question, do I have a personality con conflict? Because many times we don't see it, you know, and, and, and when we don't see it or don't pay attention to it, it's many times because people haven't brought it to our attention. But I'll say it like this. Problems keep happening. And you see the other people that you're having issues with get along well, sometimes it's our personality. So we have to do that personality check and move forward. And how comfortable do you feel with the problem? Are you comfortable with it if, or are you not? If you are, what do, how do you do it? You bring somebody else in and let them help you through the process. Hey, I need to ask you a question. I need to talk to you about something because here's what I'm dealing with. And I just want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing or I'm, 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 I'm addressing it or ha having it happen or taking care of it the right way. All right. Then recognize the problems and conflicts happen all the time. Every single day, it's a conflict happening right now about something. You probably received an email since I've been talking over the last probably half an hour. And in and, and, and your mind, you was like, yeah, I'm sitting here listening to this guy talk about conflict resolution, but I have one right now. <laughs> and we shoot that message back. It's going to happen all the time. But the reality of it is, like I tell you, keep yourself at the beginning, at the forefront, keep your name, your character, and your integrity good, and keep your health, especially your mental health, at the very forefront of what's going on. When you take care of you, you'll begin to see that you'll treat people the way they want to be treated, and you'll treat yourself the right way. That's important. And when it comes to problem, you know, large problems, chunk it down, write it down, write down as many details as you can. Don't respond all the time right away. Don't do that because sometimes when we respond, you have a have, have a moment where. And this happens on both sides. You, you have a disagreement with someone and you say something. And then after it's over, you walk away. You was like, man, that was pretty tough. I probably shouldn't have said that. But if I chunk the problem down, take look at the big pieces of it, write it all down, what will it do? It'll allow me to think through the process to make smaller chunks or, or break the small, the big chunks and the smaller pebbles and come up with a solution. All right. If I put large pieces or large chunks of rock on the ground, unless you drive a four wheel drive truck, and you just enjoy beating it up. It's not a good time. But if I would take those large rocks or those large chunks of, of rock and break them down into small pieces of gravel or pebble, it makes the ride a lot smoother. That's how you have to see problems. It's not worth me taking a bumpy ride when I can slowly just write it down, chunk it up, take the big chunks, make them smaller, and then make it a smooth ride. Now, make sure you understand the entire problem, because sometimes what do we get? We get one person's version of the story. But, you know, my mom used to have this theory. There's three sides to every story, your side my side and the truth and the truth somewhere gets stuck, some either to get stuck in the middle or sometimes pushed to the side but make sure you understand the entire problem know what it is and then prioritize the problem what's important what do we have to do first 
because we don't want things to impact the entire team or impact the entire company. And then we have this, this cultural, we have this negative, this adverse feeling of, you know what, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be bothered anymore. So of the problems, what needs to be solved first? And as we prioritize what needs to be done and we look at what need, how it needs to be done and what we're going to do first, and we do the big things first, oftentimes you pay attention if you do the big things or what? The small things will begin to do what? Take care of themselves. And it begins to unravel when it all makes sense. So how do you fit into the problem? And this is the part where you really have to pay attention and not so much pay attention, but ask yourself these questions. How do I fit into it? Focusing on the problem, you, 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 okay, we say focus, when I say focus on the problem, not as in, you know, the problem's gonna get worse, but find the solution. I said that at the very beginning, be a problem solver, not a problem cider see when you focus on a solution you're not looking at how bad it is you're looking at how good it can be you don't ask how long will this take you ask yourself how far we can go and that's very important so when you focus on the problem don't don't focus on looking at the issue itself you focus on it from a solution-based standpoint i'll say it this way it, it here's a here's a here's <laughs> yeah no i better not say that never mind okay it's a hard saying, but I'm gonna give you a layman's term. And, and when I say this to you, take it as a, with a grain of salt, but it'll all make sense in the end. You have to embrace the suck and then blow it all out. What do you mean embrace the suck? What's the worst part of it? But then how do we blow it all out? We blow it all out with a solution. Embracing the suck, suck means, okay, I'm gonna find the solution. I'm, I see all the bad things that are happening. Bring it in. Okay, all right, now I know how to solve it. Write it all down, You know, portion it out, make it the small pieces, create a, a flat path. That's what you do, focus on the solution. Then are you making it better or worse? That's important because sometimes we can say things and we make problems worse because the brain is, is as humans, we go into defense mode and many times we make things worse before we make them better. So ask yourself, am I making it better or am I making it worse? If you're on the worst side, you know, reevaluate how you approach it and then try, you know, solve the problem for, am I trying to, are you trying to solve the problem for the right reason? Am I doing it because it's for the good of the entire team? Or am I doing it because of a selfish moment? Or am I doing it because of someone that may be my favorite personal favorite employee? And I know you all don't have favorites like you don't have favorite children, right? None of us have a favorite, but you get my point. <laughs> my point is this, am I doing it for the right reason? And the, 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 the right reason is for the greater good of humanity. Why? Because we want everybody to listen. You should enjoy your love coming to work every single day. It, it, it should be at the top of your list of what you do. All right. And then where does guilt fit into the problem? Don't 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 guilt trip yourself. And don't guilt trip anybody else. You know, it, there's a coach. I know he's a baseball coach and he, he always has this theory. Don't be a finger pointer. And that finger point oftentimes is, you know, feel guilty. The war is me. You know, so don't take that approach. And then understand that where, where all parties are, are coming from. Don't take it from a one sided perspective, but look at where everybody is in the process. And then, of course, procrastination. Now, here's the impact when it comes to solving problems. Don't push it to the side. Yeah, okay, I'll say it this way and I'm gonna shoot through these really quickly. Recognizing procrastination in yourself. If any of you have children, you know what I'm talking about, or you may have been that child. Your parents say, hey, take out the trash, you know, clean your room, wash the dishes, load the dishwasher, whatever it is, vacuum the floor, whatever the chore was. Okay, I got it. And now you have the, you know, the video game kids or, you know, the favorite stream or something on YouTube, TV, whatever it is. And then you come back 20, 30 minutes later, it's not done. It's like, hey, then I. I didn't I say take out the trash? Oh yeah. What did they tell you? Oh yeah, I was going to, but I forgot. No, you didn't forget. You just didn't do it when I told you to do it. Now, when we allow that behavior to happen, what we're doing is we're creating or building procrastinators. And then children uh, uh, procrastinators become adult procrastinators. And then the impacts of what happens in their lives falls over and rolls over into the job. Now look at where you are now. It rolls over into the career. The impacts of it is missed opportunities. I had the opportunity to fix it, boom, right then, but I didn't because I kind of forgot about it. I pushed it to the side and procrastinated, hoping that it would get better or increase stress or anxiety. Why? Because procrastination said, you know what? You'll get to it later or it'll come back around. Here's your opportunity, whatever, whatever. Or we rush into decisions. Can I help you out with the rush decisions? Listen to me. When you're tired, angry, and sleepy, never make a decision. Never make a decision, an important decision, because it'll rush you into something that you really don't want to. Okay. Okay. If you ever back to the people who have children or know those who have children, which would be pretty much all of us. You ever watch a toddler come into a room? Mom, can I have some juice? Mom, mom, can I have some juice? Dad, 
Can I have some juice? Mom, mom, mom. And eventually, because they're doing something else on the phone, talking and having other chores to do, hey, go ahead, get it. Then the child go gets the juice. They, 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 they put the cup on the, on, the, on the counter. They go grab the juice out of the refrigerator and they start pouring. And then it's all over the counter and it hits the floor. Now we're angry. Why? We made a rush decision and we didn't think it through. Think about the impact that it has on the lives of other people as adults when we make rush decisions. We miss deadlines or we, we, we start missing out on what we're doing and, and our deliverables become undeliverables because we're trying to think of how we can do it. But then we come up with these things called excuses. So recognize procrastination in yourself and then talk to other people around you when you're solving a problem. Here's what we do. Number one, what is their perception? How do you see it? If you ever watch this movie, it's like 10 years old. You can go back and watch it. There's a movie called Vantage Point with uh, Forrest Whitaker. And I don't remember who else was in it. But if you've never seen the movie, it's a movie called Vantage Point. It tells a story from four people from four different places that they saw something. But it was the same incident. See, many times we look at things from our vantage point and we get one view of it. But we should ask the other people around us because when we do ask them, what do we get? Their perception on how they see it. And we hear this thing all the time, perception is reality. Not always, that's not always true because it's a perception that we create and this is what it looks like. But if I ask someone sitting across the room what it looks like, if you've ever been to a baseball game and you're sitting and if, if you're sitting left field and somebody hits a home run, what you see is completely different than the person that's sitting on the first base side. They see the path of the swing. They see so many things differently. They see the flight of the baseball from a different perspective. So when you tell the story, boom, here's what it is. And then you build that story and it builds up in your mind. It's like, okay, now I get it. Listen to a college football game. Football's coming up. We were talking about this earlier. Penn State football. Can you imagine listening to it? You can't make it to the game, not in front of the TV. You listen to it on the radio and somebody's running a touchdown. And that announcer has you in your car or wherever you listen to the game on the radio and you like ready to jump up and down because you can visually see it. Why? They've, they've given you a per perception or given you a picture of something that ignites the mind. It shows you from a different, from a different side, something that you would not see or could not see. All right. But anyway. Focus on uh, the causes of the, of, the, of the problem. What's causing the problem? Who's causing the problem? Is it something or a method that we can change? Is it something that we can improve? How can we change it? And write down their opinion of the problem, which is very important because you want to hear from other people. Hey, this is how it impacts or affects me as well or affects me as well. And then do they see it? Do they see it as a problem? So that's something to keep in mind. Now, this is in your in your handout, but it's a, a brainstorming activity that I would like for you to do. And it's come to solutions. And number one, the, what we're going to do is focus on the central topic. And then you take the subtopics and then you take the related ideas that are all around you and you fill out each bubble and you use this cr to create your solutions. You have it in your book, do it as a team, uh, do it over Zoom, but this is something that you can use as a tool to help you get through this process. And then which solution fits best is very important. Which one works best? Uh, start with, with the solution and then implement a plan. Don't always just create a method like here's a new rule and this is what we're going to do because we had one issue. No. We don't need new rules for everything. No, we're just going to implement a solution for that one for that one thing. Because one, it's harder when we implement a whole lot of rules because people don't like change. Although change is inevitable, the only person that really likes change within probably two to three minutes and they want it right now and they're accepting to it is a wet baby. Yeah, wet baby and a wet pamper or a poo-poo pamper. Yeah, give it to me right away. Please help me out and I'll stop crying. But for adults, it doesn't work that way. But let's just implement a solution. And then what resources do we need to create it? Is it, you know, a round table? Is it a talk? Is it using the exercise that you just saw before? Is it opening up, talking to people? Is it writing down their ideas? What can we do different? And then how much time and energy will it take? And then make sure that once you look at it, do I have the time and energy to find a solution to this problem? To really go deep down inside, to delve into the issue and say, you know what? man, we can do it this way. This is how much time I need. I can kind of move some things around, put this on my schedule, and this is how we can approach it. And then who are the players that you need uh, for that solution to be successful? Don't try to do it all by yourself, bottom line. That's why you have a team. That's why you have a team. That's why you have peers, because you can't do it all by yourself. If you could do it all by yourself, you would have done it already. Prove me wrong. If you had the solution to everything, and none of us do, we would fix it all. But we can't fix it all. That's not who we are. You're not Superman, Superwoman. That's not it. Okay. Then the next thing I need you to do is look at your smart goals. This is how I need you to do it. When you're coming to how we're solving problems, the methods that we're going to use to approach it, you've seen this before, probably. If you haven't, here it is. It's in your workbook as well. But we use the, the smart goal a technique. Be specific in exactly what it is we're approaching. And if it's going to take some time, make it measurable. Don't say, hey, you know what? We're going to fix all of these problems. It's been a problem for the last 15 years, but we're going to fix it in 30 days. That's not always a reality, okay? The reality of it is it takes time, okay? 
So when I was on active duty, I used to what I call the skinny and miserable days. <laughs> I was I'm I'm six feet tall, but I was two hundred and on average I was sit between like two twelve and like two eighteen if I was heavy. At one point, I got to two hundred and sixty four pounds after I retired. Why? Because I wasn't running every day. I was eating ice cream like you know I was breathing oxygen. There was just a whole lot that went into it. <laughs> eating wrong. And so I got the 260, 264 pounds, but I had to make a decision, okay, to lose weight. What am I going to do to lose weight? I'm going to change my eating habits, increase my water, become more active. Do you really think that my goal was to get down to 230 pounds, lose 34 pounds? I tried to do it in 30 days. Absolutely not. Why? Because it didn't take me 30 days to get there. There's a process. So make sure it's measurable. You don't put too much strain on yourself and the people that are around you because now it's an issue. Oh man, knee jerk reaction. Boom. Let's try to do this and fix it right away. That's not it. Make sure it's attainable. Make sure it's rewarding, not just for you, but for the entire team and the process and the good of the entire company and for the culture that you have there. And then make sure it's time-based because when you time-based things, you don't keep kicking a can down the road. This is what I need you to do. Write this down. It's time box your task. Time box your task. Give yourself a certain amount of days to get certain things done, meet the deadlines, just like working on a project, kind of like a Gantt chart. And within this 30 days, this is what we want to do. In the next 10 days, we want to do this. And over this three-day period, we want to do this. But time box it because it'll keep you in that square and it'll keep you honest and it'll move the P word out of the way. What's the P word? Procrastination. Because we all know the favorite day of the week for procrastinator is what? Tomorrow. Yeah, there you go. You already knew that, right? All right. So then we're going to do a checkup and we're going to see how's it going. Pay attention to the process. Look at the faces on the people. Listen to the problems. You slowly see them begin to move away and we move away and we see things from a different perspective. And then is it working well as, as well as it should be or as well as it could be? If not, we can tweak it along the way. Don't marry the method. This is what we're going to implement. This is how we're going to begin to solve problems or the way that we're going to approach it. Is it working as well as it could or should be? If it's not, that's okay. We can make adjustments along the way. It's just like if you ever take a flight and weather gets bad, what do they do? They make adjustments. If the storm is really, really bad, what do they do? They go to they go a little bit higher or they'll go around. They'll take a detour. Sometimes they'll land at a different airport to get back up in the air to get you to your destination. Why? Because it's the safest thing to do. And sometimes the safety that we have is not the safety just for ourselves, but the safety of the other people around us, because we can do something or say something that can ruin or impact the lives of the people that are around us. And then what can you do to make it better? You're in the room, largest room in the world. This is room for improvement. What can I do to make it better? That's the approach you take every day. What can I do to make the workplace better? You know, you don't want to give people the six o'clock gut punch. You know what the six o'clock gut punch is? You get off on Friday, everybody's happy. Yay, it's the weekend. You know, you Saturday, you get up, you may go fishing, go hunting, you know, be a part of coaching sports or, you know, taking your kids, traveling, doing whatever, camping, hiking, whatever you do over the weekend. Then Sunday morning, you get up. If you don't take, go anywhere, had a great, you know, good Saturday, clean up your house or you may, you know, go to the your house of worship or whatever you do on Sundays, go to brunch, hang out with some friends. And then your day is winding down. And then about five thirty, six o'clock, sit down. You know what? Weekend's over. I'm going to watch a movie, settling in for the, you know, bringing that flight in for a smooth landing. And then about six o'clock, six thirty, you get this punch in your stomach like, oh, man, I got to go to work tomorrow. Oh, my goodness. I don't want to deal with these people. Ooh, that's the six o'clock gut punch. What can you do to make it better? Because you don't want people to think about you when they think about the gut punch. When they hear your name, when people hear your name, what do they think about? It's a serious question. Watch this. When I say Michael Jordan, what do you think about? I say Tiger Woods, what do you think about? I say Danny DeVito, what do you think about? Basketball, golf, acting. You know why? Because they've developed something that we think about and boom, people can automatically associate it with it. When it comes to solving problems, being a good manager, supervisor, peer, whatever you are, when people hear your name, what do they think about? That's very important. So what can you do to make it better? And then evaluate the entire process and begin to move forward. The last thing we're going to do is an evaluation. We're going to take all of the uns and the nots and the impossibles out, and we're going to make it a teachable moment. We're going to make it attainable. We're going to make it possible, and we're going to make it achievable. That's how we live. You see it right there. That's how you take, this is the approach we take. Did I find, define the problem correctly? Just a quick review. Am I looking at it? Did I look at the problem the right way? Did I take the right approach? Yes. And were you on target of the root causes? Because here's the thing. If you ever want to kill a tree or plant, what do you do? You dig it up from the root, right? You don't cut the top of the tree off and then just leave it. You start to see some sprouts slowly coming out. Leaves will come out. Even if you prune a plant or you prune a small tree, then what happens? Okay, now it can begin to grow, but you see small things sprouting out of the sides. That's something to pay attention to. And then uh, 
were the resources that I have used appropriately. And sometimes the people, the resources that you use are the people that are around you. And then what do we have to do to correct, uh, course correct and why? And that's why I say be able to make adjustments. Because here's why, if we don't make adjustments, we'll, we'll be somewhere completely different. Imagine taking a cruise and your goal is to stop in Spain. You take a cross of a transatlantic cruise and you're going to leave North Carolina or anywhere on the coast on a cruise ship. And the goal is to, to land in Spain. You're traveling at 260 degrees. I'm just saying roughly, I'm not a, I'm not a mariner, so I don't care. I, I, I don't know. Not that I don't care, but I don't know. But I'm supposed to be traveling at 260 degrees. Can you imagine if we take off and we traveled at 261 degrees the entire way? Spain is here but we'll probably end up somewhere else because we're off by one degree. And as we get to our destination, we're like, okay, this is not where we're supposed to be. Why? Because we didn't make course adjustments. When you're crossing the sea, what happens is the water may push the ship or the vessel from one side to the other, but what do they do? They make course corrections. When you make course corrections in what you're doing and how you approach life, what am I doing to the people around me? They begin to feel secure around me. They feel safe around me. They know that, listen, if I go to Monty, man, he's going to figure this thing out. Well, he'll help us figure it out. We can do it as a team because we make course corrections. We were going off a little bit, but hey, let's come back. Once we get back on course, we can begin to travel in the smooth path in the right direction. And then if things get a little bumpy along the way, what do we do? Make the corrections, keep going. All right. And then were they possible, were they, uh, were the possible solutions correctly ranked? You know, I told you to prioritize what you do. Did we, in the one of the largest things right here, did we receive uh, or achieve the desired outcome? The outcome is have a great culture, great workplace, great attitudes. People enjoy coming to work, love what they're doing. And then we eliminate problems. Are all of them going to go away? Will conflict arise again? All the problems go away? No. Will conflict arise again? Yes. But the approach and the methodologies, methodologies that we use going forward will help us get there. And was it identified initially correctly? Because sometimes if you don't identify the problem correctly, what does it do? It creates a bigger problem later on. If you have a problem with your issue with your feet, or, or I'll say it this way, if you have an issue with your heart, you have an irregular heartbeat, heart murmur, you know, heart palpitations. You don't know what's going on, can't breathe correctly. Would you go see a podiatrist? Absolutely not. Why? Because a podiatrist is going to look at your feet and say, well, yeah, if you change your insoles or something, or, or you get insoles or use orthotics or maybe walk a little bit less, then the issue will go away. No, that's not going to help my heart. What do you do? You go see a heart specialist because you know that they can zone in on what the issue is. So identify what it is and do it the right, do it the correct way. Now, wrapping it up right here, the four toolkits, these are, these are in your uh, workbook, but if you don't see them, you can screenshot this really quickly and use these every day. You don't have to use them every day, but share them with your friends, your family. It's free. They can go through it and look at the exercises, but building resiliency is one of my, one of my strong suits. Please do that for me. Do it for me. <laughs> Build a level of resiliency. I'm a firm believer. I think Les Brown said, if you can, if you get knocked down, if you can look up, you can get up. He said, if you can look up, you can get up. My theory is if you can look up, you can get up. If you can get up, stand up and go and go back, get back into the fight. Every day you keep swinging. Don't stop, okay? Then sleep fitness. Try to get yourself seven to eight hours of sleep every single day. But I can't. Okay, begin to try. Turn your phone off before you go to sleep. It's a lot of tools there, a lot of things you can use, that little, a lot of ideas that they can give you. But I'm, I'm just, one thing I will tell you is this. See this? And, and I'm sure all of you have one. I don't care if it's Android, Apple, it, Google, Pixel, whoever it is, Motorola, on the side of each one of these, somewhere on it, there's a button. And if you hold it long enough, you'll get this, you'll see this. And it says power. You know what that means? It actually goes off. And if you hit power off, guess what? The phone will go off. You may have to put your code in, but it powers off. Yeah, that's part of the reason you can't sleep as well as you should. And it's like, but, 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 but. I know some of you listening to me have not had that. The, the phone has not been off since you owned it. You picked it up from the Verizon store, AT&T, USA, or wherever you got your phone from, T-Mobile. It doesn't matter. It hasn't been off since you had it. And if it looks, if the battery looks like it's getting low, you see that little red thing pop up at the top of you, you plug it in. Anyway, get some sleep, get some rest. Start with turning your phone off. It'll help you tremendously. Mindfulness and meditation, living in a moment, taking care of yourself, being mindful of life. Take some moments to meditate. And I already, hopefully you dropped some questions in the question box. Like if you have, I haven't seen them yet, but I want to show you this and then we're going to wrap it up and we're done unless there are any questions. And this is brought to you by your EAP and the EAP is the Employee Assistance Program. And we're here, here to help you. It's completely separate from your regular insurance. It's separate from your, you know, your medical insurance. It's 100% free. And it's to help you get through and manage life's daily challenges, the things that you face every day. You know, many of us face challenges and we don't talk to people about it. But one of the things that I like about this the most and why I challenge you to use it, and I'm going to show you a couple of them, is this. 
uh, we can refer you to counselors and, and services that will help you tremendously. And you see some of them right here on the screen, which is the legal consultations or the financial consultations. If you're having issues there, if you need to talk to someone because your mental health isn't in the best place, the upside is two reasons I challenge you to use it. Number one, it's already paid for. It's free. Number two, it's 100 percent confidential. Nobody reports back to human resources and say, you know what? Uh, Jane Doe or, or, or Billy Bob or whoever it is, Monty, use these resources and this is what they came to us for. That's not how it works, okay? Use the resources and help put your life in a better position. It's there, it's available for you. It's available to your dependent family members. Those who live in your house, they can use the same resources to help you as well. And to get in touch with us, all you have to do is one of these two, three things that you see on the screen. Number one, is you can call the number 888-881-5462, which is link, so 888 888- 881 link or you can go to supportlink.com and then when you go to the website it'll give it'll ask you for a code and you can create an account you can log in create a personal account and, and that way you can text and go back and forth and see what the resources are and all you have to do is put in p s h papa sierra hotel and and right in the center of the screen and you can create your account from there or you can scan the qr code that you see here on the screen and that'll help you get started hey listen the most important person on the planet earth is you You have to take care of you. You have to take care of yourself, take care of your family. So with that being said, you know, I I hope I share something with you that you can use, something that you can implement that will allow you to see your life from in a different perspective, because the better you take care of you, the better off life will be. I promise you that. All right. I see one thing. Let me see right here. No question. Just want to say thank you. Great speaking. Joy. Oh, you're very welcome. All right. So questions. No, that was a great presentation. I don't see any questions coming in either, but thank you so much for that. I think that was a great topic to be discussed. So um, if there's no more questions, we will end here. Thank you so much, Monty, for this presentation.